Hello, I'm Kevin Bothwell here at St. Thomas's Church. Welcome to our worship for this Sunday morning. A couple of announcements before we begin. One is that the Out of the Cold Walk is still coming up and there's still time to donate to the St. Thomas's team, uh, either Ruth Court or Barbara Jean Lick, and they will be doing that walk uh, in the next couple, I think it's Sunday or Saturday the 26th. Please keep the parish members in your prayers. I know that this is a really difficult time for all of us. Uh, and just the lockdown and February and all that, I also know we've done this a couple of times before, but I also know that prayers are an important part of getting through this for all of us. So please keep uh, all of us here in the parish, uh, everyone else who's a member of the parish and your particular friends in your own prayers as we go forward. I think prayer will be a significant part of getting through this. I ask you also to remember Scott. Scott and many other people work in the healthcare business and they are looking after those who cannot, for whatever reason, look after themselves. Please keep Scott in your prayers and all those, including Emma, I guess, who work in the healthcare business. And finally, my cousin Brian, has left us and left his family. Our prayers go out to the Smith family in Mississauga and Brampton and wherever else they are in this world. Brian was a, a man who lived by the beat of his own drum, but he was a beloved person and uh, posted all the time about lost dogs. Lost dogs were one of his things. So let us pray for the soul of Brian Smith. May he rest in peace. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also yes. with you. Would you join me, please? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Listen now, for God speaks to us in the words of Holy Scripture. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert, 
and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 1. Blessed are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the assembly of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they mediate on the law day and night. Like a tree planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, Whatever they do, it shall prosper. As for the wicked, it is not so with them. They are like chaff, which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not be able to stand in judgment, nor the sinner in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came down with them, that being the 12 apostles, and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. And Jesus looked up at his disciples and said to them, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Christ. Father, I pray that as I speak, your people will hear your truth and not just my words. And as always, let your Holy Spirit be with me as I speak to our scattered congregation at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. It is difficult, I know, to be in a parish where we are still in a virtual lockdown and most others have gone back to worship. I know that many of you will have questions about that and you are welcome to call me if you would like. Suffice to say that uh, this is a decision that the bishop has made out of an abundance of caution and frustrating as it may be, that's what we should be doing. There is a wonderful line 
in the baptism service, and I know you'll recognize it in a minute, but I have to say, uh, and forgive me for this little sin, that I have a great deal of fun with it at baptism interviews. So normally what I do when people bring a candidate for baptism, and it's quite often a child, but not always, sometimes it's an adult, is that we walk through the service and ask various questions about what does this mean? What does that mean? What do you think about this? And I always point out that I'm not looking for theological answers. I just wanna know that, that you have processed this to some extent in your own mind. So one of the questions, in fact, um, it's the very first one really uh, in the um, series of questions on page 154 is, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? And the congregation responds, I renounce them, or yes, or something in the affirmative. And when you think about it, what else are you going to say? During the interview though, I then say to people, so what does that mean to you? And all of a sudden we've got a problem because we don't at least anymore. And I think people perhaps in my parents' generation and, and uh, maybe the generation after that spent a little bit more time doing this. We don't think about those theological questions in our lives very much. I know that everyone here has had a professional career. And I'll bet at lunchtime on Thursday, that question was not on your mind. You were probably worried about what was gonna happen in the afternoon or how we were gonna get through this particular problem or a myriad of things, but not that particular one. And probably not, do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? The obvious answer is I renounce them or yes, but it's probably not something you spend a lot of time thinking about, at least in the context of yourself. Now, there are times when it's really easy to be judgmental and think about others getting caught in that, but I'm not talking about others right now, I'm talking about us. The answer that I have found, which is much easier for people, is to ask the question backwards, to turn it upside down and say, do you accept Jesus Christ? Do you accept God in your life and all the spiritual for forces of goodness that support the people of God? And of course your answer is yes. But then when I ask you, what are they? It's a little easier to answer that question. Spiritual forces might be things like peace, patience, kindness, agape love, we talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago, agape love, that kind of thing. So when you answer the question the other way around, it then becomes easier to see that the negative of those things are the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. Intolerance, sexual assumptions, and sexual abuse. The ability to denigrate someone simply because they are trying to do their job. That kind of thing. And as Christians, we have to be very careful of those things. Even when it's a police officer who has pulled you over for not using your turn signal or something that you think is trivial, unfortunately, it is her job to give you a ticket if she sees a crime happening, or in that case, a misdemeanor. Now, the reason I mention that is because today we are looking at Luke's version of the familiar passage from Matthew we call the Beatitudes. And you will notice some slight differences. First of all, in this particular scene, Jesus has gone up a mountain. In Matthew, it's a sermon on the mount, but Jesus goes up a mountain, spends the whole night in prayer, then chooses the 12 apostles, and then he comes back down to teach everyone. So his decision is prayerful. He spent a whole night in prayer choosing the disciples, not sort of just walking along a lake or just happening to see uh, Matthew the tax collector or something like that. It's a whole night of prayer, and from the group of disciples that were with him, he chooses 12 apostles. 
The word apostle means to be sent out. So a disciple is a follower of Jesus. An apostle is someone who is sent out to make new disciples. Jesus comes down and in the first piece of concrete teaching in this particular gospel, he says the words that you heard today. Gotta get the right mark here. He looked up at his disciples, and so now he's looking at the whole, at the whole group, not just the 12 apostles, he's looking at the whole group, and he says, blessed are you who are poor. I'm sure you've seen that translated as how happy, because the idea behind that is that you are blessed in the sight of God if you are poor. I've said many times, and I think I have preached on this passage now four times in my time here, this being the fourth, there's nothing blessed about being poor. There's nothing happy about being poor. So what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about where your focus is. And that's something we also don't spend a lot of time thinking about. And in order to make the point, he's going to turn this upside down, just like I did with those questions from the baptismal covenant, when he says to them, woe to you who are rich now, for you have received your consolation. Can we understand just that little snippet better if we do it that way? I think so. And I have to tell you that Jesus is not talking about money necessarily. He's using that as a reference. He's using wealth as a reference, but it's not the point. The point is that people who are wealthy are taken up with the distractions of looking after their estate or their car or their uh, you know, large house or whatever it is they have. Where people without so much rely on God. Jesus lived in a world where a subsistence level income was the norm. People got by, but a subsistence level income was the norm. And they all watched as wealthy people rode by in their, they're not carriages, but what do they carry people on? Anyway, whatever they carry people on. They watched f fantastic feasts. They watched all kinds of sacrifices be given in the temple to which sometimes they were invited, but they didn't have the resources to do those kinds of things. So by turning it upside down, Jesus warns us that kingdom values are going to be upside down in comparison to the world around us and that we can understand this through both the blessing and the woe. And the reason that people are blessed in the eyes of God is not the poverty, it's because they rely on God. They rely on God to make decisions about where they're going to move or what car they're going to buy or whether they need to replace a refrigerator. Even how you drive. For some time, people in the church have been trying to readdress our moral teaching much more in line with biblical values than just what someone standing up and talking says, or with psychological values, or with what's good for society values. And because we are Christians, we need to listen to that. On the way in today, I asked one of the people who's here, what are your biblical values for living your life? And she looked at me and asked for some time to think about it, which is fine because frankly, had I been asked the same question in the same moment, I would have had the same reaction. But now that I'm listening to this piece of teaching, the very first piece of teaching, that Jesus does in this gospel, I'm thinking I need to reassess this much more often than I do. I need to think about it when I'm thinking about 
am I driving to the store today or can I get by with the milk store that's two blocks away? Yes, milk is slightly more expensive there, but walking to the milk store has a much smaller carbon footprint than driving over to Superstore or Shoppers Drug Mart or something else. Now, it may be that you have to go there for other things or things you can't find there, but the biblical choice is to think about all these things and change your life because of them. Because it's not just about what you do, it's about why you're doing it. And we all know that the planet is being damaged by the way that we live. That's not an invitation not to come to church. It's simply an invitation to think how your biblical values as a Christian are motivating or at least guiding the things that you're doing in your life. I hasten to say that includes getting vaccinated to help protect all of us. It includes wearing a mask at odd moments like when you're preaching to help protect all of us. In fact, it includes trying to live by all the guidelines that come out, if that's at all possible, to help protect all of us. Because never is the gospel about me as an individual. It's always about us as a group. So there's something to think about this week. How is your belief in the message of Jesus Christ and your belief in the gospel and your gospel biblical centered values, how is all of that wrapping into the decision that you're going to have to make next week? And it doesn't matter what the decision is. The Bible will always have something to say about what we should be doing. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. Do you believe in God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. In our prayers this morning, we hold before God in prayerful support the Parsons, Partridge, Payne, Pollock, Pujol, Pye, Ratkowski, Reed, Richards, Sawicki, Semple, and Shaver families. We remember and give thanks for the work of the Samaritan Foundation, Dominican Advance, and the ongoing ministry and work of not just tourists. We pray for those who are homeless, for their safety, health, and salvation. In the Niagara Diocese, we remember St. Albans Acton, 
the clergy and lay leaders during this time of transition, and the people of that parish. We hold before God members of the St. Thomas family who are not well or have asked for our prayers, including Sue, Leslie, Elaine, Allison, Keith, Doris, Kyle, and Ed, and all those we hold before God either out loud or in the silence of our hearts. As your prayers for Scott and all those who are working in the health care system, all those who work in essential services, We hold before God in prayerful support Francis of Rome, Justin of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Anne, the Archbishop of Ontario, Susan, our bishop, and all those who work at Cathedral Place, Max, the Archdeacon of Lincoln, Kevin, our rector, Philip, John, and Jason, our honorary assistants, Aaron, Charles, and Tim, our wardens. Let us pray, saying, Father, by your Spirit, bring in your kingdom. We pray for the coming of God's kingdom. You sent your Son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your Spirit. Rouse us to work in his name. Father, by your Spirit, Bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Father, use us, unworthy as we are, to bring in your kingdom of mercy, justice, love, and peace. Empower us by your spirit and unite us in your Son, that all our joy and delight may be to serve you now and forever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Would you take a moment to share in a socially responsible way a sign of that peace with each other? Peace, Ruth. Peace, Aaron. Peace, Phil. Peace, Maureen. of steadfast love. May our offering on this day, by the power of your Holy Spirit, renew us for your service. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are using Eucharistic prayer number two this morning, which is on the printed handout. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living word through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
this Holy Eucharist is offered to the glory of God. And in grateful thanksgiving to the life that my family knew as Brian Smith. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all those who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All honor and glory are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever, amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, I invite you in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen and yet present with us now. In this moment, many are made one. We receive you, Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome your presence in us and together proclaim our love for you with our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our strength. With the saints, we worship you. With the angels, we adore you. With your whole church, we proclaim your reign. Come to us and make us one in you. Amen. Holy Jesus, we receive you spiritually in this moment, giving you thanks and praise that you have made yourself present to all your people in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. We pray you to transform our hearts that we may shine as your light in dark places. Where there is hatred, 
let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. And this all in love for you. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, in you we find peace beyond all telling. May we who share in this heavenly banquet now go on to be instruments of your peace on earth. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with us always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.